Well, Rob, we're um, all set up for the 63 Transpac race from LA to Honolulu. What was the race like? It was so different to a Hobart race. Um, the start line was off um, oh, the San Pedro area there and out between Catalina, near Catalina Island. And there seemed to be, a, you know, boats that we'd never seen before. It wasn't like leaving the club and 20, 30, 40 boats like they do here, all milling around within boat lengths. They just sort of seemed to come from... I don't know, out of the mist sort of deal. So all of a sudden, you know, uh, there was helicopters overboard, which we hadn't sort of really seen much before, and lots of planes and lots of press boats. And hoi it was a big picnic day uh, for them. Um, 14th of July. For 4th of, 4th of July. 4th of July. 4th of yeah, July yeah, yeah. So it was their big day out. And uh, we'd made a lot of friends, and they had a big um, launch that, launch load that came out to bid us farewell. We had a few Americans on board. Jimmy the rep, mm -hmm. Jimmy Sanderson, who'd sailed out on Ondine and and almost become an Australian, well, he married an Australian yeah. girl and has uh, spent a lot of time out here. Mm -hmm. uh, Jimmy joined us. Um, Maxie flew in, Maxie Crawford mm -hmm. flew in. Uh, we had the American navigator and Dean Harrell, who had a little schooner that he'd sailed to, we'd met him in, he'd sailed out across the Pacific previously to Sydney and berthed on the wharf here. Got friendly with us and when he went back, he sort of organised some crew and, and uh, facilities for us, etc. In, in, um, at San Pedro. Uh, the race itself, I don't know whether it was true or not, but there was a boat called Audacious. It was run by, owned by a multi-millionaire, Born Born, out of New York, Mr. Born Born or something. And he apparently suckered Peter into a $10,000 bet. 10000 For Christ's sake, the boat only cost Peter ten grand, <laughs> And that was a bill. And I don't know whether it was ever that he was, that, that Astor could beat Audacious over the line. Um, and the other boat that was, uh, up for line on us was uh, a boat called Ticonderoga, yeah. big tie, uh, and there were boats like we'd never seen before. And uh, we went down and had a look at um, uh, I'm forgetting the name of the big 160 footer that used to go down. Uh, doesn't, doesn't matter the story, but you know the the range of boats were from very tiny little boats. It seemed to us. 25, 26, 28 so it was mainly a downhill race? Did you find mainly that? downhill, yeah, yeah. but you had to make up your mind when you got to a certain point that uh, an alightish race, mm -hmm. and we had this big new magical um, spinnaker. The golly wobbler. The golly wobbler. Gobbly or golly wobbler, which was fantastic, you know, it was colourful and uh, it was great for filming because it just looked so good. Oh, and I'd gone out on the camera beforehand on a bit of a trial and we'd shot lots of stuff for that, so there's pretty interesting footage of the old golly wobbler up on Astor. Um, uh, you get to a certain point in the race where you either go south and up or north and down, you know, you, because of the curvature of the earth and the, whatever it is, the, the winds, and all our... Uh, best advice was you go, I think we went south and up and that was the wrong, that for that particular race it was the wrong one and we slipped back. And the best sailing, there's no doubt about it, of the race was into Molokai Channel and where we had the golly wobbler up and everything straining like you can't believe and the old girl doing a princely, pro we used to watch the speedo go up and if you hit 14, Oh man, <laughs> that was bloody it. So an audacious picture. Yeah, we, we we were fourth, I think, right. over the line, and I can't think there was audacious Ticonderoga, and there was another boat that was ahead of us, and then then Asta. But it was just great sailing, and the welcome, of course, was unbelievable. So you, like, being in the film industry, you made a film of the race, or you tripped in your hat. Where's that film now? Well, mind your own business. <laughs> <laughs> I shot a film. There's an interesting story. 
the Warner said, listen, this will be the trip of a lifetime. If you take, a, you're, you're in the film business, will you take a camera? And I said, yeah. So they got me a, a, a Bolex. But the interesting thing was the family had a Bolex, but they didn't want to get it wet, so they borrowed one off their neighbour. So I took the Warner family's neighbour's Bolex, which was apparently dispensable. You know? And I shot <coughs> uh, Kodachrome. It started off with six rolls, and of course everywhere I went I'd shoot six rolls, and that was three minutes a roll, so that was 18 minutes of film to about Auckland. Then I had to say to Peter, well, we need some more. And, and so he stocked up there. And, but I had to be pretty careful because it was a expensive film. But we ended up shooting about, I think, about 3,000 feet of film on, on the trip. And uh, I must admit, I haven't edited that film yet. <laughs> At recent Aster reunions, which we still had, the boys keep saying, how's the editing on the Aster film going? And I said, it's coming along nicely. And old Maxie Crawford, who died a number of years ago, said, we'll all be dead by the time you edit that bloody film. And I must get around to it. Yeah, and I will. Well. Yeah. I will. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so you did the race, and then you must have still had itchy feet because Sometime after, you took off again on another big voyage. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but on solo, yeah? yeah. Uh, well, that was different motiv motivation yeah. to take the trip on solo uh, a year, few years later. That was quite a lot. That was, we did, uh, pack, uh, Transpac was 63 and solo was 69, 70. So a few years went by in the meantime. But um, uh, what motivated me to do that, Vic used to come back, he'd made a circumnavigation of Australia with Tim Cormack on board, the two of them had gone. And there was a lecture given down here at the club where he showed some slides. And Vic was a very good nature photographer. And he was passionate with seabirds. And he used to take these shots of seabirds. And such a rough old bugger and, you know, fairly uncouth old character. It intrigued me that he had this soft spot for seabirds. And, and he, the other soft spot was, <laughs> intri intriguing spot, not soft spot, was that he, always, that he wanted to do it with an old girl cruise. So I thought, there's a story here <laughs> that I would like, and he planned his next trip was to go from here uh, across to Tahiti, down to Easter Island, Easter Island across to uh, uh, Valparaiso, and then down the Patagonian channels to Pudarinas, quite near Cape Horn in Magellan Strait. Um, and I was sort of put a proposition to him. If I could go as part of the voyage, at least, to make a film on it, because he intrigued me, the man. Um, and this, there was another side of Vic that I sort of thought I wanted to get to know. Uh, so I put a proposition to him where I sort of paid him, I can't remember how much, but it was a nominal amount because I didn't want to freeload, I didn't expect to be taken for nothing. And that I'd shoot a film on, on the trip um, and if we made any money out of the film, we would, I would share the, any profits. Well, there's never any profits in documentaries, uh, but you never know. So, so that was the deal that I did. Then I had good contacts at the ABC at that stage, and they said, oh, you're going off on that trip. Um, we'll commission a film on Easter Island, and if you're going to, to Tierra del Fuego, we'll commission a half hour film on that. So I had a commission to do two films apart from, totally apart from the film of the yacht. Mm -hmm. And that helped defray some of my expenses. Plus the other thing was that I was to go to Punta Arenas, uh, the tip of South America, with Vic and was going to leave him there anyway because I'd ended with Kenny Tubman and Andre Walensky in, the, in a car rally from London to Mexico. 
So I was to go yacht by yacht to the south bottom of South America and then go up to Buenos Aires where we had a car to do a recce of South America before the race and then get on with the race to London to Mexico. Um, the, the, the old Vic agreed, he said fine and I said look I can't do the whole trip with you nor do I want to. So the deal was he was he sailed from here with uh, two girls, yeah, three girls, three girls, I don't know, two or three, can't remember. I was he was then going to take let's say six months or whatever it was, uh, beg your pardon, not six months, two months to get to Tahiti. I was to fly to Tahiti and join him there, do some filming in, in Tahiti. Then I was to fly while he sailed from Tahiti down to Easter Island, roughly two weeks. I was to fly down to, to Easter Island and make a film for a ABC. Well, everything, that was all agreed and all teed up until I got a telegram from Vic um, from Tahiti saying, arrive Tahiti, all girls gone, get me two new girls. Uh, fly to, select two girls, bring them with you, one must be willing, Victor. <laughs> so that began, Not a bad challenge. that began, <laughs> and I ended up on Channel 9 Tonight Show with um, Stuart Wagstaff, and we got an, an amazing how many people turned up, and we interviewed them. I had two very fine interviewing compatriots, Don Nicobarra, and Boy Messenger. And we did the interviews on Eilina down on the wharf. <laughs> the girls were arriving, coming down, and, and, and were being, you know, selected. Anyway, we selected two. I won't Don't ask how you selected them. No, 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 no I'm not criteria. <laughs> it was Dawn Thomas and Ildigo Silvashi. And then they flew, Vic fixed up, I can't remember how it all happened, but. Uh, their airfares, and we flew out on Land Chile to Tahiti. I arrived with the two girls, handed them over to Vic, did some shooting of them in the markets, getting solo prepared and all the rest of it. And then I flew down to Easter Island. But, um, and then to cut the whole thing, paraphrase it, when the girls got finally to Easter Island, I'd shot the film. It was a bit of a disaster, whatever had happened on the way down, but those two girls stepped off that boat and said, you know, that's enough for us. <laughs> We've abandoned ship. And I, you know, tried to say to them, well, you don't get more, many more remote places in the world than Easter Island to abandon ship. I don't know where you're going to go to from here. <laughs> Never mind, where are we going to go around here? <laughs> so the old man and I, old Vic and I, took the boat. Uh, we sailed across, left Easter Island and took it across to uh, the first port of call was an island called Juan Fernandes, which is the, the Robinson Crusoe, where Selkirk was put ashore. And uh, it was funny, on that voyage, I used to have uh, uh, funny stories because the boys had taken bets, quite a few of them down the wharf here, that there was no way in the world I'd get on with Vic Meyer. You know, and you'd end up, you'd kill one another, you know, on the way down. I used to sit there every night and think, Hang on, what happens if Vic drops dead now? <laughs> you know, how am I going to convince the blokes back there that I did not him off? And we, there were two fridges on the boat. One which was, well, neither were deep freeze, freeze but there were gas. And one was kept closed most of the time and down pretty low, which was not quite freezing but pretty cold. And the other one was the one that we used every day. And I used to look at Vic and think, if he drops dead of a heart attack or something, can I get him in the fridge? No, I can't get him in one fridge. <laughs> I'd have to you know, cut him in two and put half in either fridge. And the other thing was, I thought, well, if he drops dead, can I sail the yacht on my own and can I navigate? So quick as a face, I said to Vic, wouldn't mind showing me how to navigate, <laughs> would you take noon sights and that? And I knew that if we kept going east, we're going to run into South America somewhere. But all these things, you know, on your mind when there's only yeah. two of you out there and you, you were about 16 to 17 days, I think, across to 
uh, Valparaiso and then of course into from from uh, Juan Fernandez Island across to Valparaiso. Uh, then he picked up another girl, uh, Gertrude, and uh, there. So the three of us set off at Christmas Day uh, after we sailed south from Valparaiso uh, into a place called Portamont, which has got to be one of the one of the most wonderful little fishing villages in the world and then down through the Patagonian channels, including um, glaciers and ice. And, but in incredibly sunny, beautiful weather, uh, down to Punta Arenas, and uh, Punta Arenas, second day, in came the southerly, blew up, uh, we were on the lee shore, things happened, and uh, went for a bit of a swim, and Solo had a bit of a crash, and. We all survived, and I guess that's the main thing. Yeah, and that's yes. another story. Yeah, sure, we won't go into that. <laughs> no. But was there, did you, how did your filmmaking go of all of that? Did that? Well, the strangest thing was, all the film for that whole trip, now, some of it I'd sent back, all the Easter Island stuff, I'd sent back from uh, Santiago in Chile. They freighted it back. I had on board all that I'd shot after we left Valparaiso and headed south, and including I had a Bronica, a two and a quarter square um, still camera, and I don't know how many, but a hell of a lot, it might have been a hundred rolls of two and a quarter colour transparencies that I was shooting. They were on board with the camera, all the camera gear, when she was dashed up against the rocks and and took a pounding uh, and the mast came down and the boat was leaking and all sorts of things. Uh, after 24 hours in the hospital, defreezing and pumping out and things like that, I made my way down to the boat which was then had been pulled across to the wharf and was floating, the storm had gone. Went down below and there was water over the um, over the floorboards, as it were, in, in solo. And it wasn't just seawater. The fuel tank, the oily fuel tank had broken. And it was a mixture of diesel. There was quite a lot of diesel in this mucky, horrible black water. And there were my rolls of film, some of it floating in the water. And I was about to throw, fortunately, all the movie film I had in watertight canisters. And the cameras and all that were fine. But these still films intrigued me because I was about to throw them all overboard. And someone said, well, don't do that. Why don't you take them into a lab and see what happens? I think I lost four shots. I don't know why and I don't know how those shots survived those conditions. They were soggy. You could squeeze the water out of them. They were undeveloped and what have you. Uh, so gear-wise, film-wise, everything was saved. So when Solo took off to, um, uh, on a freighter, uh, which happened to be in the port, and uh, they hoied or aboard her and took her off to Germany, and uh, that was the last I saw of Solo and Vic for many a year, yeah. many, many a year, and I took off and did the London to Mexico car rally. If we could just <laughs> talk a, a little bit about your filmmaking. I mean, you made a, <coughs> a number of wonderful documentaries, I guess, but the one that that I remember greatly was the one called Battleships. All right. Which was a history of battleships throughout the generations. How long did it take to produce? I mean, it was a, probably a two-hour show, was it? Or how no, long did it take? No. The preparation, that must have been extraordinary. I mean, the footage was magnificent. The, there was two series, Peter. The, was this was in the latter years. I did one, first of all, on the history of ocean liners, and that was four one-hour programs. That was such a success that we, we moved then on from, uh, from liners. The next series was battleships, and there were four one-hours on battleships. And after the battleships, the next one was on airships. On, on airships, and that was three one hours, yeah, they were wonderful. and that was continually going. You're telling the world perspective uh, of the influence that these extraordinary, oh, I don't know what you call them, objects, 
made in world history. And it was, the, uh, it, it was more about, people said, well, who wants to know about liners? And I said, well, it's not going to be about liners per se in as much as nuts and bolts, rivets, steel plate, horsepower of engines, all the technical side. But they played a role in the history of the world, these things, and their evolution changed the world. I'm interested in the world story yeah. of how the world changed through these things and how governments saw them and how they were financed and what their role was rather than the ships themselves. And, that, and battleships was an extraordinary success. It sold to I don't know how many countries, yeah. most countries in the world. Yeah. And um, it, uh, it hit the jackpot because it was really about the people. And in that, I was lucky enough, and I've been lucky enough in my film career to have always made programs on things that I'm interested in yeah. and love. Yeah. And the people that got involved in this, you know, Japanese that were on their offices on the world's biggest battleships, the Yamato and the Masashi, um, guy Ted Hood, that, um, that, not Ted Hood, um, oh, I've got a mental block here now, the survivor of the, Bism uh, of the Hood, um, um, Ted Briggs, yeah. who survived the, the sinking of the Hood, yeah. uh, Germans that were on the Bismarck, yeah. and you're talking to these yeah. people, and you're yeah. sitting down with admirals of the fleets, yeah. and you're yarning with them, and they're telling your story, yeah. and that was very exciting. Yeah. Yeah. But, the first film that I ever set up internationally was the first Admiral's Cup from here, for Rothmans. 1965. Yeah, and I went to, um, across to Cowes uh, for Rothmans because I was about to direct, uh, produce at least, two round the world Peter Stuyvesant shoots for Rothmans and we ended up doing all the Rothmans documentaries. And one of the things they said, well, the f uh, that Rothmans sponsored the first Admiral's Cup and they wanted a film on it. So I went there in the winter time to Isle of Wight and uh, went to uh, the castle is it? Yeah. The, uh, and, and talked to them and the place was totally deserted. Yeah, yeah. She was dead as a dodo uh, and to set up the filming but uh, during the Stuyvesant shoot I had a bit of an accident in a knee type jag in England and ended up in hospital and uh, that to be a bit of a rescue mission because uh, uh, I couldn't make it. Yeah. And the next year, just as sort of the evolution of filmmaking was, that the next Admiral's Cup in 67, I didn't go across but Maxie Lemon, who was, yes. a, who was a mate of mine and was a filmmaker from here, he was a member of this club, mm -hmm. um, went across and filmed it. Then the film was air freighted back by Qantas. Bob Ross was over there, I think, and used to put notes in it. We waited to get it off the plane here and edited those into three-minute stories for television, wrote the script, put the notes with it, and dispatched, I think, something like 38 of those copies a day each, each race to the television stations around Australia. And that's how they got the news. Yeah, yeah. And that was all by Rothmans. Yeah. And how today you can watch it happening. Yeah. But these were the days where you waited for the plane to come in with the film on board and then you edited it and then you put it into boxes and then the boxes went to the television stations and the television station put them on. Yeah, yeah. But, um, you know. Now, um, Rob, uh, you're now a boat owner. A park boat in a, in a boat called Southerly, which has got a wonderful history here at the CYC. It was formerly owned by your dear friend and our dear friend Don Nickelborough, who um, is in the latter years of his life. And you were instrumental, I think many of us helped you, but you were the driving force in getting Don's favourite drinking corner in the CYC bar called Nickelborough's Corner. And that happened almost 12 months ago, and uh, I think uh, that corner will stay forever as Don's memory. And, uh, and I know he's been a great friend of, of ours, but especially you. I mean, he would be one of the great characters of this club, wouldn't he? He certainly would. And I think, you know, the clubs are made of characters. 
And the bigger, the, <laughs> the more Larrick, in, in a sense, the character, the better the club. Uh, and this is living proof of that, this club, because through the years, members have got up to terrible trouble. <laughs> you know, the, the, the Huey Long on Dean party, the Delphine yeah. stories. Uh, hijinks. The, the, the hijinks. Yeah. There was a stage in those early years, 1960s, and I won't mention who was Commodores, but you know, it, it, the, 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 the CYC's in the doldrum was the song. There's no fun at the bar anymore. And a group of us used to meet at the Oak Stubble Bay because they wouldn't come to the club. They were non, uh, non-acceptable people, uh, noisy people to have at the club. Fortunately, the club has evolved to accept this, and I think one of the successes of this CYC is the mild acceptance of the larrikin spirit that still exists here, because without that, you've got a pretty bland club. And the odd song or two and the odd yarn or two and of course, Don was the doyen of, of those, and I don't think there'll ever be anybody in the world quite like Mickleborough. No. And the whole concept of that was, again, and I must pay tribute here to the management of the club and the uh, Commodores and the committee of the club, that it was no good putting a plaque up to remember Mickleborough the day after he died. Why don't we do something and put it up there so he can enjoy it? And they all agreed. And it went through with extraordinary cooperation and help from the management of the club. And I can't speak highly enough of it. And Don, I reckon, had given him another 12 months of life. Yeah. Well, he's still going. <laughs> and I hope he will for a yeah. long time, yeah. yeah. So those aspects of the club, I think, are the intangible things that are so important to the life and the spirit of the club. And we've got a hell of a lot of it in this club. It's unique. Yeah. Well, Rob, thank you very much. It's been fantastic and uh, some wonderful memories there for you and for all of us. And uh, stay well, enjoy the part ownership of Southwick. And uh, I'm sure we'll see you in Mickleborough's corner not too soon. Okay, Good. thanks, Rob. Thank fantastic. you, Peter. There we go.